This podcast is sponsored by Bloom. Bloom is the leading manufacturer of furniture fittings for high quality living spaces, dedicated to delivering enhanced user convenience for a better quality of living. Let's talk together about new ideas, because it's not about our ideas, it is about bringing yours to life. Bloom, we stay in motion to move ideas forward. Robert Jemison, the self-proclaimed Belfast-born architect, energy blazing with his ambition to demonstrate the healing benefits of combining both architecture with spiritual practices. Interesting. Who is the Dharma Prana Karma practicing architect influenced by his time traveling around India, his appearance on Game of Thrones and the energy he adopted from his yogic practices? What does it take to build and market a practice amongst the traditionalists of design and then to carve out a credibility within the industry around the concept that beautiful spaces, they may be creative with the essence of an experience and the science of a feeling. Very interesting. It's time to challenge design perspectives with TV's loved architect from your homemade perfect. Hello, Robert. Hi. I have met a spiritual gangster, but never a spiritual architect. Spill. Actually, before we talk about what you do, okay, let's just do our icebreaker. Okay. You're looking at me puzzled. An icebreaker means tell us something that we wouldn't necessarily associate with you. And when people hear it, they'll be like, ooh. So, for example, Oliver Heath. The biophilic um, architect, biophilia architect, he, ex- he shared that he used to be a fire eater. Behind the scenes, he's a fire eater. What would people not know about you? See, I can see you biting your lip with nerves. I'm just thinking, actually. What would people not know? Um, not feeling. I'm feeling the, th- I'm feeling the thinking. <clears throat> what would they know about me? I mean, I'm pretty open in terms of... You know, You're know, you one of nine, aren't you? And one of seven. One of the seven. The youngest of seven. And there were nine of us who grew up in a three-bedroom council house, rented accommodation, um, since demolished. But it was, oh, it was pretty rough, those younger years. There were, you know, it was, uh, at one point there were six of us in one bedroom. How did that work? Bunk beds? Uh, bunk bed next to double bed next to single bed. Next to thing, it was crazy. It was. I mean, I think that was my first awareness of space and environment, right? And we had no heat, we had no heating. I mean, there was no insulation. It was single glazing. And and then we moved to a different house again. It was only three bedrooms, but and this is in Cumber. This is Cumber, yes. Famous for its potatoes. In Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland. My father actually was a potato inspector. He travelled the world inspecting potatoes. And did you have any passions to be part of that industry? Not at all. Although, you know, he, I mean, I remember, you know, we, we had our drills of potatoes, you know, and he would say, wait, well, there and pick the third row and you get some rooster, or, you know, depending on what we were eating. But our food was very simple because there were nine of us and we didn't have much. But that was really kind of my, I mean, on reflection, I think that that's whenever I used to be curious about how other people lived behind those doors, those n- nice doors. So your passion for, for space was born from an early age, and how did that transform into, where, into becoming an architect? Um, well, whenever I was 11, I experienced my first piece of archite- residential architecture, which was a friend of mine. He's a good friend of mine now, Richard. Um, his father was an architect, and he built the house w- when he left university, not far from, from where I grew up. and. It was this house that you walk into the dining room. The entrance hall was the dining room. So it was really kind of mid-century kind of influence. There were, in, in my um, memory of it, there was recessed seating in the really kind of 70s recessed seating. And there was plain art um, glazing to o- overlooking a garden. There was open tread staircases. There was all of these kind of, you know, um, uh, 
architectural moments that that you find in the you know in this mid century architecture. Uh, there was green painted steel, so it was it was really interesting. And I thought this is the, this is fascinating. And and again, what fascinated you specifically? Because, because oh, I've been living in a house where you know even even to be able to clean your teeth, like I still clean my teeth with hot water because I never had like you know. It was, I mean, I think these are the memories. Of course, there are a lot of memories that. You know, you, you kind of push away, you, you try and deal with in your later life, which I've been doing throughout my life, I guess, with my practices. But I just think that that, that experience of um, a different type of living. Something different. At yeah. 11 years right. old, you identified there's something right. different. But I, I wasn't academic, so I wasn't allowed to do, to, 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 I did art for GCSE, but I wasn't allowed to continue to A-level, which destroyed my, my ambition to be an architect. And then I, I planned to go and study aeronautical engineering. Um, I thought I'd be a fighter pilot. And then I had an incredible social life from around the age of 17, 16, 17. And then you had the acid house movement and um, all of that. And we had the Hacienda in Manchester. Right. And right. Way back then, um, we had Sugar Sweet in Belfast. That sounds good. Cool, Which was an institution I mean, with David Holmes, Ian McCready. David Holmes became, he's a f famous DJ um, who wrote the soundtracks for Oceans, famously in 8, 9, 10, whatever it was. You know, he's, you know, he's and then Ian McCready, who was the other guy who now has a record, uh, um, a record uh, shop in my studio, an vintage clothes shop. So I'm, my studio is kind of really flexible and open. That's a whole other story. So as a child, we have a spatial awareness that we're living in an environment okay. with six other children. And then at 11 years old, we we experience, experience infinite possibilities. Well, just a, uh, yeah, the possibility of dreams. And then I heard you saying that there was a seed of thought, I would like to be an architect. Yes. But the dream was dashed. When by, by skill. By skilling. We try and skill the kids, and it's like it's, I mean that's a whole other story. But um, so I I can do that. I then failed my A levels miserably from being out, you know, enjoying my youth, and I went to tech. I actually used to walk, walk across a field and get two buses to go to a technical college in Downpatrick. And Downpatrick, because I heard about the the teachers there would make you pass your A levels with with top grades, and they did because if you missed. If you fail the test every Friday, you had a test. If you fail the test, you were out. So you worked. So I went from a, you know, an <coughs> academic hot house. Right. So I, I. Where did this, where did this word architecture come from? So your father works in the potato industry. In the Ministry of Agriculture. Yes. Yes, yes specifically with potatoes. Potatoes. Yeah. Right. Okay. And you grow up in a wholesome environment. Mm -hmm. Where does this seed? I would like to be an architect come from. That from that experience of that of that property, I think. It must be. I mean, you know, what do you want to do? Well, I don't want to. I don't want to. I want to do something creative. I want to. I, I want to be creative. I remember even thinking back when I was younger. I used to make, you make things in you know in the in the soil, you know, and make make villages and uh, out of soil. But but it was all very. Um, it was felt. And I knew it was good. I would be playing with all kind of like that is. Look at that. Just check that out, right? And I was only maybe six or seven. Younger, five, maybe four or five, you know, but I knew it was good, I could feel it. Mm -hmm. And it's the feeling that, you know, that then kind of guides you in your life or that you need to listen to in your life, right? Mm -hmm. So I passed my levels. I studied architecture then, I, I get in. I get in there. This, I mean, and a big part of the, a big part of b being at the School of Architecture is the crit system. It's all kind of dumbed down now because of all sorts of reasons we can go into as well if you want. But um, it's about kind of being able to um, explain your work and defend your work. It's a critique of your work, right? We all know it. Like. Um, but I had a stammer. And I had a stammer for until I was 23. Um, I couldn't even... Go, I had to like, ask people to go in and buy me cigarettes out of a shop when I love to smoke a lot. Um, but, you know, I... Yeah, so I studied architecture. I knew I could do it, but I also enjoyed the social aspect of it. I was, I was, I used to be DJ. Um, I, said, I enjoyed, you know, getting out, clubbing. Uh, but I got a tattoo on my arm, uh, which was really a kind of a mark of 
you will do this because it was about becoming an architect and I was in my first year of architecture school and I had all, all this, but I said, I can do this, I just need to. How did your family relate to the fact that you'd chosen that career? Great, you know, I mean, it's people, I mean, that was back, people think, our, you know, to be an architect is, you know, you know it's, it's a very, it's a great career, you earn lots of money, it's not about that. If you're, if you're a good architect, you don't earn any money. It sounds weird, but because you put all your energy into your creating your idea for your client, right? Um, and that energy, you know, th there's only so much of a fee you get from your client, and you and often you you work beyond that fee, and you pay for projects. It's happened to me in my career. You end up working. I mean, I, I, can't, I mean, I've been working constantly, like constantly. You know, in the mornings when I'm traveling, you know, because it's just a, a thought process. You're kind of percolating thoughts or ideas, you know, and. So seven years of studying architecture. Seven, yeah. Yeah. And what I see today is somebody that is free, Correct. centered and grounded. How did free. you find the structure of working towards that, that goal um, of becoming an architect? Well, the seven years beyond. I mean... Obviously, with your highlights of your your DJing and oh, no, that was that was just that was just a, that was the life that you had to have to understand the environment you're living in, to understand your culture. That's so important. So, if you want to be an architect, okay. you have to experience uh, being a you DJ. You have to experience the world. No, you have to experience the world. You have to have a the experience relationship with other, with self, and with other. And if that's at four o'clock in the morning, that's it. From you know, walking home alone. That's it's it's all part of uh, uh, you know understanding the world you live in. But mo I, I think what's really interesting is that growing up in Belfast in the 1980s, which wasn't a pleasant experience because of the troubles, that also gave me a real kind of awareness for the energy of, of environment, the energy within environment. I could sense stuff going on like before it even happened. You, you'd, walk in the, you'd walk in the room and you, you knew that you shouldn't be there and you would leave because to be there could impact on your health and well-being. And it has, has happened. But anyway, so... Um, How did you adapt to the structure of an environment such as yeah, a, a learning environment? Yeah. I was always in the periphery. I knew, I mean, and the, and the tutors knew that. My tutors knew that. And they knew I could design, I, I, I had, a, had a way of thinking, a way of presenting ideas. And, but I wasn't, I'm not, I'm, I'm not academic. I don't have, a, have that memory. You know, I don't have a photographic memory that, that you need to become a... Is that... It, so for you, being academic means having a photographic memory? I think if you have a photographic memory, you can become an academic, and, but it doesn't mean you can think, right? I think, and I think there's a problem right there because academics teach our students, and to be an academic, you, you need to have a PhD or, you know, or you need to teach full-time in our education system. You need to have a PhD. I'm a massive fan of the, the line... Let's teach our children how to think, not what to think. Mark Twain, never let schooling interfere with your education. Word. Right? Because, you, you know, schooling, you're being taught. I mean, I see it. I, like, I see it. I was teach, I've been teaching, for, I mean, part-time. I was teaching from 2003 until on and off, until 2016, 2017. And most recently, my masters. They had you back in uni. They had you back teaching. Yeah. Good. Oh yeah, and I was. I mean, and the students. I mean, I. I you know, I. I was like, okay, so. So they identified you as an original thinker with your own unique way of thinking, whilst you were learning to be an architect. And isn't that interesting? You've done a three hundred and sixty, and now you're back I teaching. Was. Not anymore. I mean, kind of pushed out because I challenge the teaching system. It's, it's unfortunate. I mean, my, my students, I mean, I, okay, so in my undergrad teaching, which was maybe about six, seven years ago, I remember I was, you know, um, I would write the brief for the studio project, right? And most recently, you know, or, you know I was writing a brief, for example, you know, um, a, a, let's, let, let's call it um, an institution or a, a, um, a place to take... Um, uh, paper money to exchange paper money for precious metals because that could become an economy right a self-sustainable local economy and that was the brief I was setting students back then so relevant today um, I think you know, there was also one 
uh, that was about emotional intelligence, the skill of emotional intelligence, right? Instead of like, typically in skills of architecture, the studio project might be design a crash, you know, that's your brief, or you know, a primary school, or a library, or like this kind of stuff that you'll arguably never design in your life, and why you doing it, and all you're doing is kind of like, it's all the teacher can kind of, you know, you, you arguably it's your tutor is setting you that either because that's their interest, or you know, for some reason or another, or because it's typical, it's a it's a medium sized building and it's typical. But I was kind of challenging them to think about, you know, what what can be accommodated within these spaces. So emotional healing could be about uh, vipassana. One guy created a vipassana, I mean, uh, um, uh, a school for, uh, for to accommodate vipassana retreats. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was, you know, but it was then it was kind of like trying to unearth these other ways of thinking about how we live and and that was my interest back then and then um, so I was being kind of like no I was just sharing kind of ideas and and, and this was after I'd, I'd come back from from that extensive period of, of traveling and then um, more recently in my master's unit with Professor Ruth Morrow um, who now teaches in Newcastle I was called without precedent and so just so I'm clear, so you completed your architect journey. Uh, yes. Yeah, you got your tattoo, rubber stamped. I, I got that, yeah, I got it rubber stamped, yeah. Yeah, I'm an architect. Yeah, and then it takes 10 years. Because then you have, you have a chartership to do, you forget all that, you know, and that's, and that's all about memory, right? So I had to, you know, I had seven years of information I had to, I had, I was in, you know, the, the, the professional exam is an exam on all of that, you know, or the, the professional kind of, kind of side of architecture. And I then read two books on mind mapping and mind mapped seven years in the two A3 sheets and memorized the image. So, so the your limiting belief was that I am not an academic person and I've got to learn how to get through these yes. next three years. Yes. You developed a system through using mind, mind mapping. mapping. It's not a, I mean, it's, it's a well-known system, but it's a way that image allows, you know, you can recall image easier than you can recall, um, you know, text, you know. Um, so the image, in my world, the image, I can see that image, I still have those mind maps. So you've identified that to help you learn, you will use imagery. Yes. That's mm -hmm. just how I, how my brain works, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, that's, you know, we all learn in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so I was able to, get, so once I, I was a chartered architect, and that was me. I could, you know, rest because, you know, you, <laughs> you have to go through that system. Now I say, now that you don't need to go to university to be an architect. In fact, don't go to university. Well, technically, you do because. No, you don't. Well, can you be called an architect without going to? Why do you want? Why do you need to be called an architect? You can still design buildings. The likes of John Poston, famous minimalist architect. Mm. Um, Heatherwick, Thomas Heatherwick. He designed, you know, the torch for the Olympics 2012, and he mm -hmm. also, you know, he, so he he designed that project over there at Spitalfield, no, um, King's Cross, you know, the, the, you know, interesting work, works globally, not an architect, mm -hmm. but his, his, his practice is architecture, mm -hmm. but all you need is an architect to sign off your work. Mm -hmm. They say that you know, those who get a first class honors degree will always work for those who who get a two one or two two, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, maybe that's because I think. You know, you, you need something more than just, you know, you, like uh, uh, something else. And to be an architect, it's a huge responsibility. People don't understand this. Uh, architects don't understand this. Because you're impacting on the health and well-being of uh, anyone who enters your building or the space you've created. Mm. You know, and, and I think that's, the, but, and that's why I take my, my practice very seriously, mm -hmm. you know. So how do we combine the essence of the spirituality with the architectural process? Um, Discuss. Feeling. It's feeling. Mm -hmm. It's certainly, you know, the instinct, intuition. We can talk about what intuition is. You know, people talk about it as this here kind of collection of past life, exper past life experiences that are then kind of, you know, become your, you know, the, the, the library of experience that you have that you can kind of touch, um, touch, but through only the, 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 the feeling body. There's the mind body, there's the energy body. But when we see, and I, I, I'm a yoga practitioner, I've been a 
practicing asana. I've had an asana practice um, for many years, well, twelve years seriously. But you know, I, st I started before that. But um, but whenever your mind um, is balanced, w sorry, w w when your body is in balance, right, then your mind will follow. Um, but buildings can impact on that, right? Uh, and that's why I, t I talk about kind of, you know, when I come back from traveling, I, I had an aversion to corners, which is a whole other story, right? But but I guess in my practice... What was your problem with corners? I just, they were so unnatural. And so I just, I just, I remember I came back and I was sitting there. <laughs> that's, fun, that's an interesting story. <clears throat> but anyway, there's a couple of interesting stories. But I, I just, I was just, I just felt very uncomfortable in a room, in, in a, you know, in a... Um, with four walls and an orthogonal space, orthogonal being kind of ordered. I just felt, it felt very unnatural and I needed to get away from it. And I remember I took off the festival that weekend, mm -hmm. slept in a tent and enjoyed music and, you know, just grooved with other energy beings, you know? And, and I guess like to bring, to, to talk about the idea of bringing the spirit connection to, to architecture, it's ultimately about understanding that architecture impacts on spirit, on si on being, on on energy being, right? And then, as an architect, you need to use your energy being. Now, this is my opinion: to feel your way through an idea, or a proposition, or a design that can support those who are occupying that space. And uh, and I've reached a point in my in my practice where buildings should not have a function. A dedicated function, and that's for a number of reasons, because um, you what you're really doing is harnessing the five elements, right? Space, air, fire, water, earth. That's what we're all made of. Is what we're made of. Is what everything is made of. Right? And once you can create an environment that understands and supports the energy, I call it prana, spatial mm -hmm. prana. Prana is life force energy. Once you can create um, an environment that sub understands and supports that through um, well through m techniques that Architectural, environmental, but also I, I employ ancient principles of Vastu Shastra, which is a six thousand year old kind of ancient Indian way of thinking about um, spatial design. Um, that again looks at the five elements, and you can divide a plan into space, air, fire, water, earth. And there are principles that, when you read the ancient texts, translated Sanskrit texts, they're really fascinating because first of all, it describes the architect. And what the architect should be and his ma his or her manner well back there his manner you know and the f the, the, the 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 friendships that they should have and think it was, it's, it's quite interesting and then um so and that teaches you the kind of the rules uh, and it's all got to do with Vashti shastra is a sister science to joy dish and joy dish is um eastern uh, astrology okay but it's also a sister science to ayurveda which is eastern medicine do these practices lend themselves to your clients or do they lend themselves to an environment or a building? It's ultimately for the, for the occupant. You know, like you're creating So your starting point with your five elements is always with the client. Uh, um, the client's needs. Uh, no, but it's, it's almost like that practice beca has become something that I can just feel my way through now. You know, I'm not... Although I do... I do, you know, overlay a diagram, you know, or sk sketch over thinking about the five elements in the water and how, you know, the, like the northeast is the prayer room or the or the room that, you know, um, is the water element. So, you know, if you focus the water in the northeast or in the southeast is the is the, is the fire element. And, and, you know, subconsciously I have, I'm working on a project at the moment and it's for a great client in, in, in Kingston upon Thames and it's a new build. And it's demolishing, demolishing an existing building. But when I look at it now, it's like it's very um, like the 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 fire element is there in the southeast. Give me an example when you say how does that work? So so taking your five five elements elements. So so okay. So you can. How does take, that work with your client in Kingston? It just okay. So I mean, I, I'm not talking directly with my client, saying okay, this is you know, it's almost like. At the end of the process, it's like... It's almost the five elements are an embodiment are of the entire process. They are, they've been considered. They are, they are, they're, they're being considered, but, you know, so for example, when you're cooking 
facing east. I mean, these are, um, not you know, I guess, conditions of, of, of this ancient Vastu Shastra and any Vastu. I mean, there's a Vastu University in, in India. Vastu? What's Vastu Shastra. That is the, the science. It's the yoga of building. The yoga of place. The yoga of space. The tell, me about, tell me about the yoga of space. Well, it, it understands that, that the, the five elements, right? It understands that, as I say, there are conditions... So, for example, and, and this, so so the yoga of space is the principle around which you and, design your buildings. Um, I I do okay. So, I I have that knowledge, and that knowledge comes from uh, working with a client to design a temple and monastery back in two thousand and four on an island in Northern Ireland for a Vedic community, right? So I studied this. I spent years, and that's why whenever I closed my office in two thousand nine. In, in London, I get a one-way ticket to Delhi to explore these temples that I'd studied because I'd studied temple architecture. I was standing a temple. I learned about Vastu Shastra. I had read the texts. Um, I had designed the building. In the buildings, I was very versed in it and I wanted to go and explore, you know. The, the Western world, mm -hmm. from what I can see, is that, the, you know, the majority of, of possibly the clients that are available to architects um, enjoy science and objectivity fact yes. yeah. and when we think about feeling that's yeah. something that is an intangible and that's, disagree I, mean, I can feel this room you can mm. feel this room mm. you know you can feel any room you're in it, mm -hmm. you know you, 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 you we move through space that we have we have this aversion to being within you know and mm. and that's just a but but if you read those signs how you move through space whether it's in the city or you know mm. the alleyway or the the park the park mm. you just slow down moving through a park you know if you think about why you're doing that it's because of what that space the energy of that space that, that you're moving through mm. um what i was saying there is about applying that that to my work in terms of um and i i know you're saying about our existing building stock and our residential buildings are i mean i think then they don't Understand. I mean, the, they are of an of of a of another generation. Our, most of our building stock, right, across the, the how country. so in terms of energy? In terms of you know, in terms of when it was constructed. Okay, so we have our you know, um, terrace buildings or you know of you know of, of um, inner city or you know um, we have our semi-detached kind mm -hmm. of suburban living mm -hmm. in the 1930s, right through the decades of the 20th century. But there they were designed for a certain way of living not for um for how we occupy space mm -hmm. and that's why <coughs> and that's why i get so many people coming to me i mean <coughs> asking me to uh, help them to rethink their space the, like their existing buildings i'm really interested in existing buildings because we all most of us live in those in those buildings that are ill-considered mm -hmm. i mean most buildings are ill-considered even by architects they're ill-considered right because they don't understand the so one of I go into this. Well, right. So you call yourself a spiritual architect. I, I, what does that actually do. mean? Um, it's combining the spirit practices with it's, it's merging all my practices. I mean, I, 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 again, another moment in my career when I just thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm an architect, but I've got all these practices. It's like, well, I just need, need to merge these, you know. Merge what? So you merge my thinking about you backpack through India. Backpacking, I didn't backpack. You qualified as I travelled. Very different. Um, I and I travelled in rural India. I had to get away from the tourists because I wanted to Im immerse myself in the, in just in a different culture, like right in the heart of it. And and that was a, an amazing experience to understand how 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 we live in the West. You know, like reflecting like w when you're moving through indigenous cultures to another part of the world. And I had to draw a map on the sand because I was kind of traveling at one point down the west coast of India on my motorbike and I'd never traveled on a motorbike before on the roads until I was in India I just had to get away from the tourists and I ended up doing almost 20,000 kilometers on that motorbike which is still up there in the Himalayas but um, I, 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 I had a hammock and I would, I would throw up a hammock in the, you know, on the coast and, and, and all of a sudden you're surrounded by people and you, you thought you were away in the middle of nowhere and it was all rural and, and, but and the communication was stifled. You know, most people can speak English in India, but you know, in these rural places, not so much. But I used to draw a map of, 
of the of, of the world on the sound, right? And I, uh, Alan would be huge, of course. And then, like, uh, not intent, well, not intentionally, but it just happens that this went from then England, and then, and then you'd your perspective of the world. Correct, correct. So you move through Europe, and then and then and then you move through, and then and then you, and that would happen. That would occur, and then you think. I remember then looking here. Let me just see, check that, or have a look and see how wrong I really am, you know. And then you start realizing that Europe is just this little place on the planet. Yet we see it as everything, right? And it's all, and it's a, it's a, it's a created culture, you know. It's not. It doesn't understand our culture. Doesn't understand the elements. Doesn't understand how we, sh we should be living on the planet. The elements, fire. Space, air, fire, water, earth. It's what earth. We're, all, we're, all, we're all made of. Is what yeah, and light. You know, we're we're light. You know, it's, yeah, um, yeah. So th that was a real learning, kind of. The, to, to only when you're out of something can you reflect on it. And it, are the things that you learnt on your travelling, not backpacking? You've brought me into check there. You're travelling through India. Are these the things that you were not able to learn during your ten years oh, becoming yeah, an artist? I was skilled. I was school, you know. I mean, but I was educating myself through my through 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 my you know through my school of architecture, my own interest, and I mean, there's a lot to learn. You, you, okay, so I this is quite controversial. I think all architects should be stripped of their title, and they should be changed to professional builders, because there's so many architects out there who are building sub you know stuff that they call architecture, and it's not. Architecture are those moments in, in our city whenever you know something really comes alive and you can feel it in the building, you know. And um, I think architect, the, the title architect should be attained by by practice. And how would you attain it? Okay, fly flag, and if you had kind of you know green stamp, you can create whatever environment you want in a few sentences. For for whom or for what? To become a building. A builder of buildings. An architect, or you mean you, what would you have to become you a, to, to attain the title of architect? Yes. Uh, a practice that un understands the world we live in. You know, understands kind of, um, you know, w w let's say worships the sun. An architect that worships, and, and, and generally they do or they talk about it, light. Excuse me, but but really it's about um, understanding the, the the. I mean, I talk. I, I t I've, I've, I've talked about this a lot, uh, and it's been edited quite a bit on on your home made perfect. But but really, it is ultimately about understanding the sun and uh, and Surya, Surya Namaskar in y as a yoga asana is a salute to the sun. It's your morning salute to the east, right? I'm not saying every architect should be a yogi. Okay, so how does this translate? How how would I love and 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 a pre I live on a lake and and my outlook is water and that calms me and I have like right. a morning practice. Okay. How does this relate? Okay, so so to to somebody watching this who has a home and thinks yes, I want to. Uh, I'm looking to embody a more wholesome mm. kind of building outlook. We that's could hard. include solar panels. And well, that's I mean. I will certainly get off grid, right? Which means um, technology that allows you to get away from utility companies mm -hmm. who control you and you know can turn you into a debt slave. It's like our education system as well, you know, creating students that are becoming debt slaves through substandard education in mm -hmm. university teaching. Mm -hmm. It's you know I, the, the same as with the home. People people think that they need. Five bedrooms. I mean, I've I've had. I mean, I did a one episode of um, your home made perfect was series two episode two I think Panama and Anoush, and they you know they were talking about having you know but growing a family and they're going to have three or four kids and they wanted the five bedrooms or whatever and I'm like well actually why would you build five bedrooms why not ha build whatever you want for yourself that can become five bedrooms the building without a function it can, it's hyper adaptable super flexible and that means hyper adaptable you could add an extension to nope. it. You, so I'm interested in building volume as well. I mean, this comes from just my, my, my work because if you have a, if if. Oh no, wait a sec! Wait a sec! Tell me what you mean by becoming adaptable. So this family. Okay, so I, I mean and, uh, that episode's class. You know, where I created essentially three rooms: upstairs living, 
there was a downstairs large room at the rear. There was a large room with a courtyard in the middle, right? So we had three rooms, okay? <clears throat> but I had three staircases. So when you arrived in through the public part of the of the house, you arrived at upstairs living through the first staircase, okay? You were then taken through, you had a choice, the staircase on the right or the left of the living space, and that could take you down to a, to your, around your, a circulation space around your courtyard, to a room at the back, the large room at the back, or the large room below. But you could divide those two rooms. So you, the staircase still access the four rooms then, instead of two, right? So you create volume with, 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 your, um, with your budget, and, but it's one that becomes adaptable. So I talked there about create the building that doesn't have a function. So, so, so all the rooms are interchangeable? Yes. Except, of course, your utility room. Yes. Mm -hmm. So your utilities are considered. I remember when I, whenever I did a... So, for example, the bedroom... So the... Bedroom could be, a bedroom could be a study. I mean, how we live now, you know, oh, I, the, that's the box room, that's where I work, you know. Mm -hmm. It, it, it happens anyway. And the benefits for this are, the benefits for this Maximum fluid flexibility. And, and if you want to change, then you can change to, depending on time of day or time of year. Mm -hmm. So there was a competition, um, the time, it was in the Times paper. I remember I come home from t traveling for uh, um, four weeks to, to visit my, my mother, she wasn't well. And I was at home and I had to do something. And I, I saw a competition for Britain's future home. Uh, I thought I'll end this competition because the problem with the homes that we have in suburban living, let's say, and the brief was for a suburban <coughs> semi-detached property, okay, that could be, you know, what would that be like? And so I created a, a home, first of all, that understood that it could be a single unit or it could be four units by just closing off two doors, okay, um, within the building. So you weren't extending or remodeling in fact the extension i talked about was an extension around the edge so you would add that layer you know you'd add another layer another zone another glazed you know edge that could provide green landscaping or additional kind of like a winter garden right but it was based on an idea that um in suburban living you can be i mean which is essentially designed by road engineers okay because you can be in the same street but you can have a north-facing back garden and your neighbour opposite has a south-facing back garden and probably sold for the same, the, the same price, but yet yours is more superior to the, to the house opposite because that north-facing back garden is cold, damp, wet. You know, the, the, the light to the front is where you enter the house, so you move through that space. So, and that's a big problem for people, right? So I designed this, 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 in this competition, which was a, a building that understood all cardinal points. So if I can explain this, so it was just, I created a single opening that, that was repeated, okay? Well, it's a window, a okay. door, a window. It was just an, open, an, an opening in the wall, okay? But it was the same size, and you could fill that in with either door or windows. You could enter the building wherever you chose, right? To, so if, if the light was at the front, make the front your private part of the house, even though it's at the street, okay? By entering at the side or the back, for example, okay? Then to get over this, the, the, the suburban idea, so you could have a north-facing you know, edge and it happens and somebody's a south-facing edge. Well, instead, what happens if you had a sectional shift, right? Which meant that the ground floor on the left side, let's say the, the, the north side, um, took you to the first floor on the south side. So you had all cardinal points, for example, right? So just kind of trying to think about how you, we, we could live in, sub in suburbia mm -hmm. and still, and, and, and have a, have an enjoyable building to be in and again there were four principal rooms sleeping you sleep what you want depending you know but it was all then i was worked at, around kind of the golden section uh, and there were layers of ideas and chamfered corners that allowed flow and things like this but it was a competition and i really enjoyed it of course i knew what well, you know i didn't i didn't even get listed or anything of course not but on the bottom actually commented on who on the bottom you know he wrote the architect i do yeah and he said he, he enjoyed it. But um, it was, world's I, I greatest was, philosophers. It was an interesting project. Who do you admire? Who do you look up to in the industry? I think um, architects who are working with their uh, their spirit, like Smiljan Radic um, from Chile. He's a great architect. He did the Serpentine Pavilion a number of years ago. And what do you like about that? What do you appreciate about it? Because he's he's building, he's 
he's he's an artist. He's building his, you know, he's he's responding to the world with with ideas that are that, that that's a, a creation. That's a you know, it's how we should be working. I think as architects, you know, when you build what you what, what feels right, you know. Um, there's a great architect. I mean, there's a great architect who I end up spending time with, um, just by complete coincidence. Uh, serendipitous kind of journey um, that led me to Richter Plastria. Richter Plastria is an octogenarian living on the edge of a national park, north of Sydney. I used to teach my students about this guy. He was, he he has a um, a plywood cabin at Lovett Bay. You Google Lovett Bay. You'll see the house, it's plywood, no glass, just really a beautiful little structure. It looks like a Japanese temple. He, 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 tra- he was trained in Japan um, for a bit, but um, I just got a kitchen outside and the toilets across, you know, a plank, and you know, it's all about living on the, on, on, on the earth. And he has a bath outside, you know, and I end up, in my journeys, I find myself in his bath passed me a joint and it's like we're, we're under the stars and, and for him to be a practitioner like that who isn't about you know having a big practice uh, I mean I, I, I feel you know it's, uh, like me I'm not interested in having I'm not interested in having staff once you have staff that's whenever the you know you, you start managing people I'm not interested in that you need to be adaptable particularly now in this time you know but Rick is somebody who has built some beautiful projects. You are somebody that's all embodied their authentic self, despite being working in what is considered a traditional environment. So, you know, for me, I would rank architects amongst, you know, the professions such as lawyers, doctors, you know, there's a set of rules that need to be adhered to mm-hmm. in order to complete a process, mm-hmm. which you then receive a stamp. And you are somebody that's managed to remain unique, authentic, and from that place, you have attracted mm-hmm. a specific client. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what I hear from you is the client is the start of your creative process. Yes. And a client that is aligned with you is ultimately the perfect client. Correct. And mm. the perfect project. Mm. I mean, I would love to. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in... in um, architecture as product right I think that we can need, we need to start thinking about um, architecture in a different way so um, and then, and this is actually maybe in the back of the, 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 the desire for many to get off grid become self-sufficient you know and I think there's a there's an opportunity to create something and 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 this kind of um, stems from a thought I had you know I have a, a um, young kids and they're going through the skilling system and porter cabins and all that and, I, and I've been thinking about a project that can become the model for the new it's called um, preschool building right which is a transparent structure full of green almost like a take the key gardens and you know scale it down and give it a different you know simple geometry and and you can understand the elements and heat and light and water and earth and all of that and ground them and you know and there's I think there's an opportunity there and I think that, that there should be or I would love that's the dream project to create that for children you know to create that um, building that can be deployed across any landscape it could be a school building but a building without a function so it could be a work a workspace it could be a coffee shop it could be it could be a gallery, okay, it could control the light, but it could be, it could be so many, it could be so many things. And this is something could that home. could be translated onto a balcony. It could be translated. This is a thing. No. Do we need space for this? It's a building. It's a new building. It's small. I mean, I'm working on projects which are actually, you know, most recently, you know, there's a, you know, another kind of, and and this is a personal project because I'm interested in. Again, nomadic architecture, right? No, wait a second. Now you're going on to that nomad. Wait a second. Let me just okay. keep on this but, building. But, but, but right, this, so is this is not a building that you can replicate. This is not is a building. Buying, it's, 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 it, this is a I'm building about, made out of glass. Well, well filled with nature. transparency. It, so you're within the elements. I mean, I say, you know, I, there's a, uh, on Twitter, which, you know, there's a pen tweet that talks about, you know, the, 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 the you know, the pinnacle of architecture is creating a transparent, um, surface like a you know a, like a, a a net or a, a fabric transparent insulated fabric that you get through over any structure 
which means you're connected with nature, but you're, we have shelter, we are insulated, you know. So um, I guess in terms of that idea of this here, um, model building mm -hmm. for a preschool building, for a school, for it, so it's, it's, it's deployed as a, as a self-contained um, off-grid, it provides its own energy, you know, deals with its own waste, for example. I think that I think there's an opportunity for that, but it's also transportable. Mm. I think that's because it could be also home. What would you say to anybody um, who might comment that um, this is this is a bit phony? This is this blending of spirituality and architecture is it's kind of of the moment. in terms of my practice. No, forget you. This is not personal to you. Okay. This is just, you know, to anybody commenting that actually um, blending spiritual practices, you know, which are very hot and topical at the moment. Of course they are. Yeah. With something like as traditional as the, you know, the world of architecture, the blending of these two feels phony. Well, that's, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. It's my experience. It's pe people's experience. I mean, you, we can talk about y how one feels space, and everyone feels space. If they feel the space, if they st stop for a moment, you know. And so it's not it's not bony. It's it's actually the essence of our being. And I think that we need to understand that. And even coming through this COVID, we need to look after ourselves. We need to understand. We like we need to you know supplement. We need to be aware. Because if you, if you don't have your health, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. But this ho it's so interesting, this whole um, branding of the word spirituality. We were talking about the branding of who I am before. Um, I remember years and years and years ago going on a client meeting and walking into a house and feeling tense, uptight, right. as if something was wrong. Yeah. And even before I had heard about the concept of spirituality, whatever that means to different people yeah. and to me now, um, I had an understanding of the of the importance of energy mm -hmm. within a right. space and a okay. building. We all do. It doesn't take an architect to to know that you don't need to go to architecture school to be an architect you just need to feel space okay but to to do it well you need to have a library of experiences <clears throat> okay and, and traveling and experience because whenever i was traveling but like whenever i set off in, on that journey um i was already a practicing i, I was an award-winning architect i'd already built projects i've been you know i've been teaching so I had that way of looking at the world and I just continued that into these other cultures. And was, we, then the world opened up completely to, you know, so, but only because of that desire and ambition to see, you know. Um, three things that, three things that you instantly can contribute to a client to help improve the energy in a room. In terms of a design idea? Whatever floats your hair, whatever blows your hair back. <laughs> for me declutter well yeah that's not architecture though because there's an energy in, in totally. products that's why I bought these in for you are these yours? yeah we can touch them that one I like that yeah. one and I like this one the black onyx yeah. so for me a bit of a hippie decl <laughs> declutter a space come on two yeah. more um well <laughs> What influences the energy within a room? Space, air, fire, water, air. Get I mean, all this here, you know, hermetically sealed boxes that we live in. I mean, and this is all part of, as, as, our, as practicing architects, we are tied to regulations that are unhealthy, in my opinion. You know, like a sealed box. Um, so more glass, open windows. Mm, open windows. Just, just allowing the air. The flow of air. The flow of air. Mm. Of course, more light. Mm. More, like more light. I mean, how do you? You know. So sometimes, you know, um, people approach me and they say, "Oh, I, I can't afford to do anything." I'm like, "Listen, a project could be five hundred thousand pounds, or it could be five hundred pounds, right?" If you came to me and, I mean, and there's a good friend of mine, um, and he was saying, "Here, I want you to look at a project for me. I've got five hundred pounds." I'm like, "I'll be over." Just have a look, you know. Just, a, just what a challenge, right? And it, c it could be something very simple, but but that, but but uh, you can still transform your home. But every home is different. This is more. This example is more than five hundred pounds. But one of the 
mo- th- one of the, the most positive energetic spaces I've ever been right. is an area within the Maldives. Okay. And it was on a beach hut. Right. Yeah, on stilts. Right. Surrounded by water. Right. And as far as the eye could see, there was just water. Right. And fish in the water. Wow. And the beach, the hut that we were staying in, had this retractable ceiling. Right. Which obviously let the flow of air through, let the light come in, and there was just the noise from the ocean. And and for me, and that the, what was the is room a like? vibe. What was the room like? It was really good quality natural linen. Okay. It was very, there was wood. Right. I mean, it was a complete embracing of the wholesome right. experience that is nature right. within kind of an environment that we can enjoy two or three days. It cost a freaking fortune. Of course it did. Go and, swim in the, go and swim in the ocean and then you're totally emerged in the energy world. And, that, and that's why, you know, and, that, and that's why swimming, and I guess that's your closest, that's, you can't get any closer to nature than swimming. So, you're an architect. Yes. Yeah. And there's a TV career and there's Game of Thrones, which is huge. Yes. How do you? How does your energy fit into Game of Thrones? Where does that come yes, from? I received a, I received a phone call one day, asking me if I'd like to be in Game of Thrones, because I was, I, I had no interest. I didn't even know. I'd never watched an episode of Game of Thrones, and I was in it. I haven't had a call from Game of Thrones. There's a reason why you get a call from Game I, of Thrones. Because it was local. Because it was local, and because maybe a long, maybe someone said here, um, this guy will be an extra, and, or or not. I don't know. I have no idea. To be honest with you, I have no idea how it happened. Random and universe experience. Random, and then. So you were an extra on Game of Thrones. What is that? Ex- what's that like? Series five, episode eight, or series eight. One of those, right? But I was, I was, I was scheduled to, to do it for thirty days. Okay, thirty days of filming, as an extra, and I was like, oh, I'll have a go at this. I, I mean, this is before I, before, I mean, I closed my practice two thousand nine. I opened my practice again in two thousand nineteen. This was about two thousand seventeen. 16 and, and now around the time of the t- t- TV work it was just before the, the, the TV work um, and I thought why not it was an experience and I was a wildling and I ended up there was five coach loads left Horn and Wolf docks to go to the quarry t- for filming um, on the first day and the second day four coach loads left people just it was horrific the experience of it for most people for a lot of people I mean kids were coming from all over Europe just to be in the Game, in Game of Thrones and there's me full Gore-Tex right underneath you know the wilding gear and there's kids here freezing and one just wanting to be there being Game of Thrones and because this is a massive production it's massive but I, I started to speak up for the kids because these you know there were platters of watermelon being passed through for the, for the cast and everything I was like hold on a sec these guys are freezing give them a break and, you know, at least give them some shelter give them give them an idea of whenever did they fire you? no I only lasted um Oh, I, after after the third day, I was like, you know what, this is wrong, right? Well, this is wrong. Welcome it's, to TV. TV is not glamorous, right? <laughs> it is not. It's waiting around, and it was. It Robert was, wants watermelon. No, I didn't. I don't. I don't need it. But I could see that I was fully. Listen, I had my. I was kitted out. I I was prepared. I was just there to observe and to enjoy and just to experience it, right? But then, it was around Christmas time, and I was flying to London. And I was at Belfast City Airport, and that big wildling with the, you know, with the ginger hair and the big beard, he was standing beside me, getting coffee. So it was I was like, "Hey, uh, how's it going?" He said, "Yeah." I said, "I was a wildling. You probably don't remember because I only stayed there for a few days." He said, "I remember." I said, "I was shocking how you guys treated the, the kids." I said, "Yeah, that's TV work." And then just walked off. I was like, "Well, not glamorous, but it was fun at the time." And but it I, hurt I was your in it. It hurt your sense of justice. Oh, you know, I always stand up for those kids. You know, anybody who's, you know... An underdog. Of course. Mm-hmm. That's important. And, you know, these... Yeah, anyway. How do you find TV, then? How, how, how do you find the experience of television? I agree. It was a great team. A great team, you know, Geoff Wilson, Kelly Walsh, you know, um, and it was great fun. And it was new to me. I know, if a door opens, walk through it. And it was, you know... Um, but, but the most important thing about, about that... So p- people don't know this. There was only going to be eight episodes, okay? So there were 16 projects. There were two per episode. We did 16 projects. 
from the first flight to meet the first client on camera without even seeing the property, on camera at the first house to having to complete all the work, all the design, all the drawings, this is me without a practice, and have it off to London for the VR guys, six weeks. And that was a long time for you, or that was a short time period? I, six weeks to design it, um, it, 16 projects, six weeks. Like, you know, I've, I've, I've been working on a project, one project for three years, right? So this is com compressed. However, again, an opportunity, I thought, yeah, let's do it, why not? Let's see what happens. And only by pushing myself through this, right, and saying, okay, let's do it, right, that I was able to, I now reflect on that, to realize that having that compressed time in the design process, I would never change any of those ideas, which means that, that first idea, that instinct, is the idea. And I employ that in, throughout my practice now, and I'm, I'm doing consultations now online. Trust your gut, trust your Trust instinct. your gut, and I have... I must have completed 290 minute Zoom calls, which are, you know, there's a lot of work behind the scene for me to find the idea before I present it, but over 90 minutes I have, you know, 300 hours of footage of design ideas, sharing all this information, and over 200 episodes, let's say, of your home made perfect, just giving ideas, and they're all unique to the person. I ask them for their information, and they tell me their stories about their lives, and, you know, their history, and their family, and it's, it's you know, it's really interesting, and, amazing people and that was the best thing that came out of the TV work was well the platform to meet these amazing people but also that um, just the, that trust to, to understand it's just a you know what you're doing your instinct is, is correct mm. that you know to that idea follow your instinct it's what are some of the judgments people make about TV so I've worked in TV it is not glamorous Everybody works. A normal day in TV is 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 about three times the volume of work that right. other people right. in other jobs are experiencing. It's hard work in TV, isn't it? it I mean, it is. I mean, like we were. It was. It wasn't oh. so. It wasn't so. I mean, it's not that it was hard. It was fun. I really enjoyed it. Like, I mean, I, I did. I really enjoyed working with with the whole team. What did you love? meeting people and coming up, coming up with the idea and then the green screen and all and but the, the 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 crew i remember okay so how i get into your home made perfect was because i was asked by a, to, to be part of a project a series called your home made, called um 100k house tricks of the trade and pierce taylor w w was hosting this but then they decided in another series to bring in six guest architects and a guy who was working with pierce on restoration house or something um Kieran Long, who used to work in the VNA and who's publisher of the, in the Architects Journal, he put my name forward. He said, You need to speak to this guy because Kieran knew my work, he published my work, and that's how I was offered this project, which was for a post office up in Goole in Yorkshire, okay? And it had a glass front to, uh, to a village green, and the budget was 10k. And they were living upstairs because they couldn't live in this shop. and I went over there and kind of like come up with the idea of taking that floor there and just put, put, elevating it off the ground. And that was, and, but that whole idea of the change in level, you know, there are a, a number of kind of things that have come out of this work, which are kind of um, re re recurring themes, which I was to realize out of this body of working with re existing residential property, like move the front door, move the staircase, they can transform, totally transform a house, right? But this was just the change in level. I lifted that, that room up in the post office and gave them almost a, a box, you know, or a balcony within the green, as opposed to being like the pond, they were looking down. And it was a, it came in, it came in under budget, mm. under 10 grand, and it was off the back of that that I was offered your homemade perfect. Mm. But I remember that working with a cameraman there, and he was directing it as well, and we went out one night and found some pub in a local town, and found a pool table, and found a jukebox, and he was talking about his experiences of, you know, as I, as I mentioned, you know, um, Hacienda, you know, Stone Roses. It's going right back to, and we still on some music and get very drunk. And, and so it's a bit, you know, you, you meet really interesting people. Mm. It's fun. I couldn't do it full time, no, no thanks. But it was a good moment of my career. Robert, it has been fascinating talking to you, and um, my energy is feeling positive and, uh, and grounded. Thank you, Thank you for your time today.
Now, if you have enjoyed what you've heard today, like or subscribe to our weekly podcast. We are here every Monday morning, the Design Royalty Podcast. We're disrupting and challenging design perspectives. Like and subscribe. See you next Monday. This podcast is sponsored by Bloom. Bloom is the leading manufacturer of furniture fittings for high quality living spaces dedicated to delivering enhanced user convenience for a better quality of living. Let's talk together about new ideas because it's not about our ideas, it is about bringing yours to life. Bloom, we stay in motion to move ideas forward.